All right, Father, what a privilege to be part of your family. Pray tonight that you give us insight and understanding into our own souls, and especially how we relate to each other in marriage. Help us to understand Jacob and the way his family was so messed up because of their not only their selfishness, Father, but how they had been trained and how they had, what they'd picked up from others, how they'd seen their own families function, and they carried it right on to another generation. Help us to see that tonight, Father, and help us to understand the depths of our own soul that we might break those patterns and l leave a legacy with our own family of moving in a different direction back toward the Lord. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Ron had asked me to continue with the marriage theme, and w I did two lessons not too long ago. Rick, you weren't here, uh, and I wanted to I wanted to mention how grateful I am to Rick. We sat down and discussed some of these things, and his feedback's been very helpful to me to encourage me to continue trying to clarify some of these issues. Maybe some of you tired of hearing me teach about, but still there are issues that need to be clarified there because there is a marriage counselor. I mean, I've done clearly more marriage counseling than anybody here. And uh, maybe not, maybe Ronald's got more, I don't know. But the thing we'll talk about tonight is the number one issue. It's the number one issue that I deal with in people. It's these hidden ideas in their heart that come out with each other in these pressure situations. Nothing great, no greater pressure in your life than your marriage. No, no place else in your marriage, in your life that you are called upon to perform, to be real, than in your marriage. Christian marriage is an important ministry uh, and method the Lord uses to illustrate his love for everyone, for his creatures. And when a Christian husband and wife reach maturity, see, here's the goal. Here's the positive goal. is for a Christian husband and wife to reach maturity and surrender their hearts fully to the Lord and live out their, their assigned roles to fully give their heart to the Lord in these assigned roles, this relationship's form the image of Christ in the church and is a great ministry and witness, if, if, if only to the angels. If only to the angels in Ephesians 3. The wisdom of God. So the greatest calling that we have is to our marriage. The greatest ministry that you have. Listen. Don't think that God's up there smiling if you've put all your heart and soul into something else and, and, and you're neglecting your marriage. It is your number one ministry. Listen, and if we can't get that one right or at least exert all of our focus and, and effort to get that one right, what's the good of doing a bunch of other stuff? I mean, that's just, that's a dodge. And look, I know marriage is the hardest one. It's the one that requires the most of us. It's the one that digs the deepest into us. That's what this is about. Because there's a way to win this. There's a way to win this in your marriage and stop hurting one another with old baggage that pops up and reaches out and operates ungodly ungodly and it's harmful every time that we operate out of any concept or principle other than Christ in the biblical principles we do harm to one another where we could have done good and edified we do harm we don't just, it's not just neutral. And listen, you got to be able to forgive and come back to the middle and start over again. But understand, we do harm. 
when we don't deal with old man stuff that comes up and grabs our soul and says, be angry, be jealous, be fearful. Be fearful is a huge issue. It's Listen, I see it every day. People living in fear. Fear of losing their loved ones. Fear of running out of this, running out of money. Fear of this, fear of that. It's just fear, constant fear. Fear for your children. So, let's look at some concepts here. I, I did a, several studies on stress, things that stress your marriage, and I, I've got five here. The stress of daily adversities. The stress of combining personalities. The stress of combining different uh, traditions. And the stress of subconscious programming, which we'll talk about tonight. And finally, the stress of being the object of the spiritual conflict. These are all areas of stress in a marriage. And listen, they, they, they're, they're listed here in the, basically the order in which they're experienced. You know, as a new couple, especially if you're younger and you're not spiritually mature, you don't recognize all these deeper things yet. You know, your main focus is just trying to pay the bills. And then before long in your marriage, you're f trying to adjust to each other, each other's personality. And hopefully you did a little homework on the front side, which most of us didn't, and you're compatible with that person, and you're not exact opposites, uh, so that you fight over everything. But, you know, one wants unsalted butter, one wants salted butter, you know. One turns the toilet paper over this way, and one turns it the other way, you know. So, but... This subconscious stuff, this stuff that we pick up along the way of our life and then we bring into the Christian life and into our marriage with us, these old ideas, I want to share with you why, why this is important. Why do I keep teaching this and harping on it? Why does Ron keep talking about the old man and, and why are we talking about this? Let me tell you why. This group of believers is one of a few groups of believers, in my opinion, in, in maybe the world, that's capable of understanding these things and actually applying the doctrine to be able to have victory in this area. Baby believers can't study this. They can't learn about it. In Arkansas, when I stayed there five years, I'd never talked this, never, never talked about it. They weren't ready. They couldn't hear it. But you can you are believers that are at a place of maturity where you can grab a hold of this and have victory with it. And it is important to do. It's the next stage of growth and it's this next stage of victory. So let's talk about... Now, do you know what I'm talking about when I say these programs, these, these tapes that play in our head that cause us to get angry and react to each other? that really don't have anything to do with the other person and their behavior. Or it has to do with past pain or past disappointment or past fears. Yes? No? I mean, have I lost everybody? Or Do you, do you understand that? Yes? Okay. Because blank faces, poker faces. I, I think some of, you, some of you don't really have any old man stuff, do you? All right, we start, and, and this was where Rick and I sat and talked the other day. He was very helpful to me. He's, you know, got to explain this thing out. Uh, you start with the blank slate, and you develop beliefs as you, as you grow up. And these beliefs are intended to help you understand your world and, and find a way to survive and find happiness. Now, the unbeliever is unable to understand spiritual ideas. Do y'all know where to you know y'all know where that's found? First Corinthians two fourteen explains that the that the natural man, the man without the spirit, what is it the the sukikos man, is unable to understand spiritual things because he doesn't have the spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal these things. To the soul. 
So you have to be a believer. So when the unbeliever develops his ideas, it doesn't include anything spiritual because it's impossible for that to happen. So the unbeliever, for instance, I was saved at age 21. Until 21 years, I developed nothing but old man ideas. It was my own way of dealing with life apart from God. I had no divine thinking within me. I was dealing with my life basically from a human standpoint, trying to be a good person, trying to do what I thought was right, good things, things that were returned to me in a positive way. You know, I was a pretty all-American boy for the most part. Then I got kind of crazy for a while, but uh, anyway, it was all human. No God, okay? A lot of it was divine establishment. A lot of it was moral behavior, but it had nothing to do with God. There was nothing spiritual about it. And there were, there were ideas in, that I believed and strategies that I developed, ways of relating to other people that I built into my soul that it became habitual. And listen, when I got saved, God didn't wipe all that out. He didn't wipe all that out. He freed me. He broke the chains of the sin nature. And he broke the chains of those ideas in my life so that I could be free to uh, think in, in Christian terms to be spiritual. But this all came with me. It came with me. And what's more, it continues to this very day, 40 years later, to be a hindrance to me living the Christian life fully continues to be a hindrance. I still find myself fearful in certain, instead of being bold and just wide open for the Lord, I find myself still holding back and reserved. What is that? That's not the Holy Spirit. No, no, that's me. That's me. That's me growing up as an introvert thinking, well, I just don't want to talk. You know, uh, I just... Better not tell you what I think. But Secondly, the believer, though, once you get saved, you begin to develop another way of thinking, which is the Christian way of thinking, if you learn the Word. So the believer develops an old man system before salvation when they're spiritually dead, but when they receive the Holy Spirit, he or she is able to know and believe doctrine to form this new man system. So now you got both. No church Tuesday, Wednesday. All right, now you got both. Here's your mind. We got some more of these things. Yeah, there's a bunch of them in here. Here's your heart. Here's an idea that comes into your mind and you evaluate it to try to understand it. And once you understand it, you're going to use it, you're going to evaluate it based on what you've already believed. And if you decide to believe this idea, it's going to be transferred over and become part of your heart, and it'll be part of the way you think about things. You've seen this before, right? You understand this? The only thing that gets programmed into the subconscious, into your heart, is, the, is what you believe. So if when you were five years old, you believed the moon was made of green cheese, you know, then, and you've never changed that idea, then you still believe that. Okay? Or if you were five years old and your parents divorced and your father left and then later on your mother remarried, and then that guy left, then you probably are expecting somebody in your life that you've attached yourself to to leave. Why is that? Because that's what you got accustomed to. That's how your life went, and that's what you now expect your life to be. This is what happened to Jacob. <laughs> Jacob, wow, Jacob... You know, there's a, there was an old song called Victim Volunteer. Jacob thinks he's a victim, but he's really a volunteer. 
you know, he, his mother came from this group of people he went to. His mother came out of that, and his mother was a character and a half. I mean, when Isaac begins to get a little dim in the, in the bulb, his bulb gets a little dim, then she starts to maneuver and, and manipulate and everything to get her way. Well, he goes to Laban and discovers that's her brother, right? Discovers, well, these, you know, they're all chips off the same block. And uh, so is Jacob. And so why he was surprised when he woke up with Leah, you know, he should have seen that. He should have seen that coming from miles away. But just listen, all that passed down. Not only genetically, but training wise, this was the kind of people they were. These, these, these are people you get everything in writing. Get everything in writing. And then you hire some thugs to enforce it. But anyway. So when you believe something, it becomes part of your heart. And as a Christian, you have two belief systems. You have two. Now, this one... The old man is powered by the old sin nature and it's connected intimately with the old sin nature. In fact, it's the logic that makes the old sin nature dominance in your life reasonable. It, this, this logic says, it's okay, have a little pleasure. You know, have a lot of pleasure. What's wrong with that? Enjoy yourself, you know, or this is the one that says, me. Now, this is where we get into the marriage. It says, me. What about me in my marriage? What about me? I mean, when am I going to get mine? I'll tell you where you're going to get it. You're going to get it from the Lord. If you don't get it from the Lord, you're not going to get it. Now, you, we get nice things from each other, but you've got to look for, to the Lord. And one of the problems is we look to each other. Now, thirdly, the old sin nature in the old man belief system is the source of temptation. Listen, the Galatians 5, 16, 70 says these two fight each other, opposing logic, opposing desire systems for your volition for you to choose. Now, we know this. Ron teaches this all the time. Okay, now, thirdly, I've given you some stages of development about how we form belief systems. This might interest some of you. From zero to two, the Greek words are brephos and napios. You don't have a lot from zero to two, uh, survival instincts and temperament. You don't really have knowledge at that point. You don't develop knowledge till you have vocabulary. But you're focused, you, you, in, in, you relate to the world through your motor skills uh, and your general impressions about life. Here's what happens to a kid is he's a little, he's a year old and he, and he cries and mom comes quick, takes care of him and he thinks life's pretty good or he cries and mom doesn't come at all or is, un, is unhappy or depressed when she comes and he thinks, hmm, life's not really good. It's easy to get directed early on in life that way. Just by basic environment can steer you one way or the other, and your basic impressions that get put into the depths of the soul, those things are probably not ever get rid of them till the next life. But from age two to six, the pious, you develop vocabulary and start learning definitions. You can only think in a concrete way, though. And this is where egocentricity kicks in, and this is the key to the old man system. Egocentricity is, is not selfishness. Egocentricity is the limited ability you can only see things from your own perspective. You can only see it from your side. And when we live with each other, if you don't, if you don't grow out of this egocentricity, then all, all you'll be able to care about in your marriage is seeing it from your side. That's all that's going to matter to you is your side. You're not going to be, the, see, be able to see it as a whole and care about your partner's side of the deal. And that's a tough way. Thirdly, 6 to 12, the technon, 
a child under training or under authority. This is a rapid expansion of factual knowledge from age 6 to 12. Hopefully, egocentricity becomes less and relational goals and skills develop more. Uh, the old man, you have ideas about causing others to meet your needs. And finally, from age 12 to adult, you begin to develop intangible forms of logic. Your brain fully develops about 22 or 23. Um, you can consider the world, philosophies of life, etc. The point is you're born spiritually dead and separated from God and unable to understand divine logic. All of our initial ideas in the old man come from our parents, friends, the world, and they are developed for, the, for this one purpose, to serve self. To serve self. This is the problem. Is that, listen, not only do we carry the sin nature for life, that's in our body, but we carry these ideas we've built our, throughout our whole life into this deal with us, into the Christian life, into our marriage, and these ideas reinforce the sin nature again and make, make sinfulness and selfishness reasonable. You have logic for it. If I don't stand up for myself in this relationship... I'll get run over for always. See, that's logic that you tell yourself that says, I better start, I better fight back. I better fight back. And in our culture today, there's a, a zillion women who believe that, who believe that fighting back is, the reason, is a reasonable approach to Christian marriage. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Doesn't mean to be a doormat. Doesn't mean that at all. But listen, until you're ready to give your submission to the Lord as a gift, I'm not sure what it's worth. Still, it fulfills the role. See, it has an earthly role and it has a, has a heavenly role. The earthly role is it makes your relationship work. The heavenly role is it, it serves the Lord's purpose. So, fourthly, let's talk about how, does a, how do you form a belief system? Because, listen, the problem is we have an old man belief system as well as a new man belief system, and these two compete with each other for our volition and basically for our faith. Because you use faith to program the system and you use faith to, uh, to apply the system. Simplicity says, here's an issue. Y'all got that? No church next Tuesday or Wednesday. Here's an issue in your life that you're dealing with and you're going to deal with it either with old man or new man. Right? One or the other. You're going to let your selfishness or your Christ-centeredness be the one that approaches. And these two are fighting. And whichever one you believe in the moment will give you the most advantage or the most benefit is the one you're going to use. Or let me say it a different way. The one, the one that you have made the most habitual made the most habit is going to be the one you naturally go to. It's your default. You know what the default is? It's where you just naturally go to. When you've got all of these old man ideas still in your soul and here comes pressure, adversity, your default position is to naturally go to what you've always done. It's only as you begin to mature that you're able to stop and go, oh, okay, no, no, I'm not going there this time. I'm going here. I'm going here. No to you and yes to the Lord. Okay, we, we, we with that? All right. So the way these get formed, and the reason we need to know that is because if we're going to unform this one, 
We need to know how it was made so that we can unmake it. Now, there's an idea, and I'll go ahead and deal with it. There's an idea within doctrinal believers that I held for many years, and that is that these things can't be changed. That we simply use 1 John 1, 9 to confess the sins that come out of here. See, this is what produces sin, the sin nature in this logic makes sin reasonable and we live in sin. And therefore, when we sin, we just 1 John 1, 9, try to get back in the spirit and that's the end of it. That's the end of it. And we stay focused over here as much as possible and we just simply ignore that. And that's how I lived for a long, long time until I discovered that I couldn't get free of this, that this thing kept coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. And when I was single, it was pretty easy to not see all that because I didn't have anybody sweet and wonderful in my life to challenge all that. Beautiful, sweet, and wonderful. But when you get into intimacy, all of a sudden it's not what you're doing that's so matter. It's why you're doing it and what's actually in your heart that becomes the great issue. Marriage opens you up. I mean, it requires all of you. Especially if you're with somebody who's wanting to make, uh, this is all of me. And listen, if you say, well, I'm not married. Listen, you're married to Jesus. And I promise you, he wants all of you. Every last bit of you. And all of this stuff that you hang on to over here, It renders you incapable of giving yourself to the Lord. This is not for him. This is not from him. He didn't put it there. He doesn't like it. It's like enemies in the land. When they went into the land and they left these enemies in there, they became the thorn in their side all through their history. That's what happens when we leave old man ideas in our soul. They just pop back up and back up. It's what happened to Paul. Paul's this great, great believer, and he, <laughs> he wants to be known as this great, great believer, and he has a chance to go to Jerusalem and show out in front of all the big guys. God kept telling him, if you go there, I'm going to put you in jail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your belt and wrap you up, buddy. He's like, I'm willing to suffer for the Lord. Yeah, I'm willing to suffer to go get my approval. So, he... Here's how we do this. So here's how we do it. Here's how it's formed. It's very simple. We've already talked about it, but here's your mind. Here's your heart. Here's idea X. You take idea X in and you evaluate it to be whether it's true or not, valuable or not, important or not. And then if you believe it to be true, it comes over and becomes either part of your old man system or your new man system. You continue building an old man system after salvation until the day that you listen only to the word. You follow that? Before you're at a point that you're still listening to other stuff, what your friends think about the president. See, how many young believers right now, they hate the president. A lot of them. (laughs) A lot of them. That's right. Thank you, Robert. That's because they have believed stupid stuff. But, listen. Anyway, never mind. I won't get into that. Uh, You consider an idea and you write, listen, your goal over here is to arrive at understanding. Do you understand the idea? Yes. (laughs) A lot of... (laughs) If you believe the idea, the idea is transferred over to the heart where it becomes part of your belief system. We call them norms and standards and ideas by which you live your life, the way you view things. Your viewpoint of life is programmed literally by the, all the things that you believe in your life. You just add them up. Can you imagine how many things you've actually believed in your life? I mean, do you remember being in middle school and high school and 
early years as an adult and all the questions you had and all the concerns about relationships and how is this ever going to work for me and what am I going to do with my life and how does life work and so many questions that you ask over here and come up with ideas that you believe and try on at least for a while and you go, boy, that was a stupid idea. You know, and then, anyway, a new idea is evaluated. You compare it. Once you get it in here and you understand it, you compare it with what you've already believed. And if it fits, then you decide to believe it. If you decide that the idea is true and usable to you, then we, we will transfer it into the heart. And listen, here's what's dangerous for all of us is that once we put something in our heart, we believe that it's true and right. From then on, we assume that it's true or right. We assume that everything, see, everything I have believed is right. And if you don't see it that way, then you're what? Wrong. And that's how it, Every egocentric person thinks that their way is right. So when we disagree, what here's humility. Humility says, you know, I've believed a lot of things in my life. I wonder how many of them are actually right. And I'm willing at any moment to be challenged on any of them. If you can show me in the word, and I'm willing to change. See, that's what has to happen but for you to, be, to even be able to see these things and especially change these things. So you entertain an idea, you evaluate the idea, you decide that it fits with your system, and so you decide to believe it, and it becomes part of the way that you think, part of your belief system. Once believed, the new idea is transferred to the heart and assimilated into the system of existing ideas to be used as the situation requires. And once the idea is assimilated into the belief system, and this is really important, this is really important, okay? Once you put the idea in here and you use it in your life a number of times, you know what happens to it? It turns into a habit. It becomes a habit. Because you've done it, and you've done it, and you've done it. And when that, next, that stimulus comes up, boom, you get to where you just automatically do it. That's all these beliefs that are in the depths of your belief system. That's what's happened to them. You've used them for so long, they're just automatic. You don't have to think about it. I mean, if you've developed some con uh, conservative way of thinking about life, and you hear... <laughs> You hear some of the stuff that's going on now, you don't really have to do a whole lot of in-depth analysis of that. You just automatically know that's ridiculous. You can determine just like that because of these habituated beliefs that are down in the gut, deep, and they're turned, they become habits, and they cycle through your soul automatically. Here's what doesn't happen is because you believed this thing so long ago and you've forgotten that you even believed it and you don't even know it when you use it, doesn't mean it's not there and it doesn't mean that it's not interfering with your life. Just because you're not consciously aware of it, there's about a zillion ideas in the subconscious that function daily in your life that you're not aware of. And the fact that we're not aware of those things is tantamount to a sin. We ought to know what's going on in our own soul. Letting, all, letting half of our soul just function automatically unaware, that's not the Christian life. That's not the Christian life. And listen, this old man is going to either produce lascivious sin or religious sin. And you're going to either be an, a lascivious tempted person or you're going to be an ascetic tempted person. And the ascetic person loves order and discipline. They have a lust to see things straightened out and corrected and 
for judgments to be made and for rules to be kept. That's the ascetic trend. That's how you end up with religion. Now, you've got a chart, and this is Rick's. It's very, very good. I want you to see. On this left side, the inherent side, is what you're born with. These are your basic capacities at birth. You have the ability to think, although you have no thoughts yet. You have self-consciousness, but you don't know it yet. Volition is very rudimentary in its development. Temperament, which he's included, which is incredibly important in a human soul, uh, which Rhonda and I have found out and done, you know, as I've developed as a psychologist, I've learned about all these things, wonderful things, uh, these testings that you can take to determine if people are compatible or not, or they work together or not, or they're going to kill each other or not. Uh, temperament, you're born with. We have one child that was born to us that by the time this child was nine months old, if you said no, she would beat her head on the wall. I wasn't going to give away her gender, but beat her head on the floor. And figuratively, she's still beating her head on the wall even today. But that's temperament, and you're born with that. You can alter it to a minor degree, but you, you are what you are. Finally, emotion, which responds to your mentality, and the sin nature, which is in the body. Now, on the right side, Rick's, Rick's given us the content of what we develop. Mentality begins to function, and we begin to develop vocabulary and definitions of ideas. You know, the first thing that a child learns what is book, you know, table, phone. They define, they learn definitions. And as they develop vocabulary, they begin to able to combine these things. So, the more things that you believe, do you know what a frame of reference is? A frame of reference is all the ideas you've ever believed are formed together into a system. The soul just does it. God designed the heart to just do that. It's like a computer. It combines everything and it creates a viewpoint. So a new idea comes along and you, uh, you, you compare it to your frame of reference and your frame of reference says, no, 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 no. We don't believe that. Or, yes, that looks like the right thing to believe. We are going to believe that. That's what forms through from your ideas. And, again, vocabulary and categories. Listen, the mind works categorically. That's why we teach that way. It's not because of some mystical thing that we heard somewhere. It's because that's how the mind works. That's how all college courses are taught. If you, let's say you go to college and you're going to be a biologist. You're going to learn biology 101, right? 102, then 201 and 202. You're going to learn the basic categories and the more advanced and more advanced and more advanced. And that's how you have to learn the Bible. So as you develop, this is how everything develops in your life. And the key to this in the spiritual life is what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. None of this works without the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the things Rick confronted me about. He said, you don't, you don't mention the Holy Spirit. So, okay. I mentioned the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the, is the person that makes the spiritual life real. There is no, there is no spiritual life without the Holy Spirit. He is the spiritual life. So, once we habituate an idea, once we put it in here through faith and it is assimilated into the system and then we use it in our life, it becomes a habit and becomes automatic. This is why it, no matter how much doctrine you learn, with these ideas still within your soul, they're still going to cycle up automatically, automatically. They're going to, they run in patterns. You have a stream of consciousness that causes, these things run in patterns. 
If you've observed your marriage over the years, you see that it runs in patterns. It runs in patterns. And the reason it does is because this runs in patterns. The spiritual life doesn't run like that. The spiritual life runs moment to moment and responds with truth and love and grace and mercy moment to moment. This stuff is all about me and my agenda to serve me and get this other person to serve me or to at least complain when this other person doesn't serve me. It's all about getting that other person to be what I want them to be. And that's the problem with being married from the old man. Now, how do you form the subconscious? Now listen, <clears throat> this is big money stuff, but I'm not going to charge you this time. This is big money stuff. There's a lot of people in the psychology business want to know would under, would, would want to understand this, but they don't have any doctrine. Once an idea is believed and assimilated. Uh, you've, you've, uh, we've already mentioned it. It becomes habituated and functions automatically. And once it becomes automatically, we don't even have to think about it consciously anymore for it to function. You follow that? It just works by itself. I mean, listen, we literally do choose it, but it happens so fast we don't even know it. Listen, when you go to tie your shoes, you don't think about it. You don't think about it at all. You just do it. And you do it the same way all the time because you've habituated that idea. But in your mind, you're telling yourself to do that. You're just not aware of it. Thirdly, once it becomes automatic, we don't have to think about it. And God designed the heart this way for these ideas that we program into it to operate as needed without deep conscious thought. Listen, if you had to, th if you had to reevaluate everything you'd ever believed, before you could do anything, you, you, you would never get anything done. Uh, so, as we become less and less aware of thoughts and action, they operate beneath the surface of our conscious mind. The subconscious is simply the layers and layers of ideas that we've accepted that have become part of the system that operate automatically without our awareness. It's not some mysterious thing. It's just layers of ideas that we put upon layers of ideas. Isaiah 28 talks about the way ideas work, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's how thinking works. Okay? You follow that? It's just layers of ideas. If we could strip all the... Listen, if I could hypnotize you, which I can't, and I could strip you back down to all your ideas back to when you were 10 years old. Supposedly, you'd be able to remember all that and go back to a particular day when you believed an idea. Here's something else. Let's say that something happened to you when you were 10 years old that was the most hurtful thing that ever happened. Maybe you got hit by a car and you were in a coma for a while and when you woke up you were terrified and you were scared for maybe the next whole year of your life to get in a car okay things like that happen to people did you know that with the spirit's help that you could literally go back to that time in your life in your so within your soul with the holy spirit and jesus christ you can't change the event or the facts of what happened but what you can change is what you believe about that and how you feel about that. And you can literally eliminate the fear associated with that. Because even at 50 years old now, you're still going to have a, just a residual fear connected to that. And under certain circumstances, if you, start, if you get in another car wreck, you're liable to freak out. You can go back. You can't change your past. What you can change is what your heart believed about your past. 
And when you change what your heart believed about your past, it changes everything. Watch this. Let's say 10 years old, here's this car wreck, okay? And this kid believed that being afraid was the reasonable way to think about this event. That's logical, isn't it? That, okay, I got into a car. This is what happened. So I believe cars are dangerous. That's not a lie, is it? He believes that. So every time he has to go get in a car, what happens? Boop, 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 boop. Right? Not because of the car and not because of the accident. Because of what he believes about the accident. What he believed as a reaction or response to the accident. When you change this belief, it takes all the power out of that event. All the hurt and pain is removed from that event. That's what God wants to do for us. This study that I'm doing is not just about making you a better person. It's about freeing you from the hurt and pain and the stupid stuff in your life that hinders you from being joyful and and full of glory. That's what it's about. It's about freedom from all of this wrong stuff that's happened in the devil's world and the reactions that we've had to it. That's what I'm trying to help you with. So, the subconscious is simply layers and layers of ideas. You also have defense mechanisms, which we just described. A defense mechanism, let's say, anyway, let's just take this same kid. Ron just told me I needed to tell a story to get my point across. So here's my story. This same kid, you know, he's so afraid of cars now that that when he goes out to get in one, he has to pretend that he's somewhere else. He has to pretend he's on the beach or on the baseball field or something. He can't let his mind, his mind won't look at the car and acknowledge the truth of it. So what he does is he distorts his reality in his mind so that he doesn't have to face up to the reality of his situation. Really, what he's not wanting to face up to is the lie he told himself about the accident. Do you understand? When he told himself that he should be afraid of cars, that was a lie. Why, why should he not be afraid of cars? Was Jesus Christ there? Did he allow it to happen? Did he allow it for good? Until we can go back to these times in our life when we were hurt and understand and believe and change our heart about that event. If you still say that event was wrong, was bad, was terrible, then you don't understand God yet. You don't understand the plan of God yet. And God wants to come back and take that that terrible thing that happened that hurt you so deeply. He wants to take you back to that place in your life so that you can see it from his eyes and let go of this lie that you've been holding that, oh, that was so bad. No, it wasn't. It It was absolutely right. It was perfect. It was God's perfect will that rolled down in your life that one day and it rolled right over you and instead of being able at that point in your life with the capacity to worship him and accept it from him and understand that it was right and good, it hurt you so deep you reacted. Now that's a huge wound in your soul and he wants to go back and help you heal that and free you from all the pain that's still associated with it. This is how These old man ideas get released and rejected and removed from your soul so that they don't keep hurting your mate and your loved ones 
Every believer possesses two belief systems in opposition to the other. The old man is a me-centered, self-serving, worldly, sinful. It doesn't have to be sinful, though. It can be religious. It can be very moral. Your old man system can be very moral and very judgmental. The new man is a Christ-centered, God-serving, other-serving, always edifies. We carry the old man into the Christian life with us, and it competes with the new man. The question, how do we deal uh, with the old man's destructive effects and rid ourselves of it? Now, let me give you three theories on how this works. Theory one is what I said earlier. We inhale the truth. We confess our sins when necessary. We simply do the best we can. We say, I'm doing the best I can. And we ignore any idea of the old man. Just forget it. Don't worry about the old man. Don't want to hear about it anymore. Al's taught it a zillion times. Don't want to hear about it anymore. I'm done with it. I don't find it to have any personal value in my life. It's because you've ignored it. You've said, okay, if it's over there, it's over there. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to live over here. And when I catch myself sinning, I'm going to confess it, and I'm going to stay focused on the Lord. And listen, you can have a semi-successful Christian experience that way. I'm, a lot of people live that way. I mean, they don't even ha- inhale the Word, and they live that way. Or confess their sins, and they live that way. But second theory is inhale truth, confess sins, focused on Christ, which causes the old man to be suppressed. The more you focus on the new man and the stay focused, set your mind on things above, not things of the earth. You understand what I'm saying? You stay focused over here. It ultimately suppresses this over here. This old man system gets suppressed so that you can, you can live above it. This is in line with the idea, and it's been taught by some really wonderful people, including myself, that the Word of God is like a toolbox. And when we have a specific need, we go to our toolbox and we pick the doctrine that deals with that specific thing, X for X. We pull it out, we use it, we fix the situation, and we put it back up. That's how I lived for a long time, thinking that if I just did enough of this, of course, I didn't really even know about this. I didn't even understand what this was. I just knew I had all this doctrine. I just couldn't seem to uh, live it, that all this other stuff, this negativity kept overwhelming me, and it sent me on this journey to discover these things. But anyway, uh, we use the individual truths in a toolbox. We pull them out and use them as needed. If we have to take any, if we do any taking off of the old man, it's done passively. Listen, the old man is dealt with passively. Okay? We just focus on the new man. Keep on inhaling doctrine, inhale doctrine, focus on the new man, and this is dealt with automatically. Now, that's what I taught for a long time. The third theory is the one I hold to, is we inhale truth, confess sin, and when this comes up, rather than passively saying no to it and yes to the Spirit, we actively confront and remove old man ideas, replacing them with new man ideas habituating the new ideas into the subconscious where they become automatic thinking so that you're not just suppressing the old, you're removing it and replacing it and turning the new man into your new subconscious automatic thinking so that this goes all the way down to your core and it's not just, it's not just tools that you pick out of the box when you need them, it's who you are. It's what you are to the core. See the difference? To me, that's how it has to happen. Now, how do I, why, why do I believe that? Why do I believe that's right? I mean, is it because I'm a psychologist? Now, you see the, you see the verses here. If you will, follow me in your Bible. Romans 12, 2.
There's more. These are just some more of the famous ones. Romans 12, 2. I want you to look at what, especially what Paul says. Now, here's our, the influence of the world. Our, uh, verse 2, do not, or literally, the negative with the present imperative can mean, to be, can mean to stop what you're already doing. Stop being conformed to the world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, when you look at this, is there, uh, what does Paul say we're to do? How, we're, how are we to deal with this negative side, this old man side, this worldly side? Are we to just be passive? Now, all these verbs, we're going to look at our middle voice verbs, meaning that the believer acts upon himself. Believer acts upon himself. Uh, go to Romans 13, 12. Let us behave popular, properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, um, No, wait, go back to verse 12. Yeah, the night is almost gone. The day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside apotithomy, take off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. See, that's a middle voice verb indicating that we're to act upon ourselves. that where, where the deeds of darkness still exist in your life, you're to remove them, not passively wait on the word of God to do it. It's really important. It's really important that we understand this. I mean, if you don't think that, if you, if you continue to believe that you're, you can just passively deal with this, it will not ever be dealt with. You won't deal with it. And most people won't deal with it because it's too hard. It's hard. Huh? Oh, it's freeing. It's the most wonderful freeing thing in the world. All right, Ephesians 4. 22 through 24. We'll do this quick and it will be done. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. In 22, he says that in reference to your former manner of life, that you lay aside the old self or the old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, the learning process, and then put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness from the truth. So here you have your soul and belief system, old man belief system, which continues to tempt you to use these old ideas, manipulation strategies, maneuvering strategies, anger strategies, fear strategies. Paul says when those things come up in your life, you're not to just passively say no to them, hoping that doctrine will one day remove them. Here's why, listen, here's why the word won't remove those things. Because they are beliefs. They are beliefs that you have adopted, and the Holy Spirit will not make you believe or not believe anything. That's the believer's job, is to decide what you're going to believe. We have to do that. And the reason that these things are still in your soul is because you believed them at one point and habituated them that are still rolling. And when they come up in your life, you're to grab a hold of them and re remove them and then replace them. I call it erase and replace but I've been, I've been around Ronald too long, I guess. I just can't. But anyway, all right. Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13. This is a confusing translation. Brothers, I do not regard myself as having laid a hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. When it says forgetting, does that make you think that you're not supposed to think about it anymore? Forget it, right? It's not what the word means. The word means to leave it behind. 
There's a quote from an ancient text that talks about a guy that left his coat behind at the house. He left it behind. What he's saying, listen, Paul in chapter 3 just talked all about his life, his old life. Now, he's, he's clearly not talking about forgetting what came before. He's talking about dealing with it properly. All right. The next one, Colossians 3, 9, and 10. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed by a true knowledge from a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. So again, we have an active function of removing the old. Hebrews 12.1, anybody know what that says? Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us, what? Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles, and let us run the race with endurance. So there is a laying aside, a taking off part of the spiritual life. Go to uh, James chapter 1, verse 21, which we just studied Sunday. He says, be slow, be, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, taking off or laying aside all filthiness that remains of wickedness. So there's a taking off. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Therefore, Laying aside all malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, like newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word. And finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. I'll read that to you. Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, then perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, the Bible knows nothing of a passive approach to, the, to sin and evil residing in the believer's soul. There is no such thing as a passive approach to that. When you discover that you've got sin and evil logic, when you've got logic in your soul that says, I'm more important than God, and that my needs are more important than yours, and when you're not meeting my needs the way you want to, I have the right to be angry and frustrated with you, which is marriage counseling. When you have logic and beliefs in your soul that tell you that, you think that God wants you to just passively let that lay? I don't think so. I don't think so. What's more? Listen, listen. I don't really know what goes through people's souls and thoughts about this teaching, but I t will tell you this, that when you, when you give this a shot and you find wrong thinking in your soul and you confront it and you throttle it and you run over it with a car or shoot it dead with a gun, break it into a million pieces and sweep it up and drop it into the ocean, and you do that again and again, that stuff removes itself from you and doesn't return. Understand? No more living in rebound. It doesn't return. When you take it off, it doesn't come back. You replace it. That's victory. You follow? That's victory. Anything less is not victory. It's a peace treaty. Time out. I won't bother you. You don't bother me. But it doesn't work that way because that sucker is going to come bother you. Now, the Bible knows nothing of a passive approach to sin and evil in the believer's soul. Every one of these verbs to take off is in the middle voice is reflexive, meaning that the subject acts upon himself for his own advantage. The spirit reveals a specific false idea carried over in the old man's system that he wants us to remove. 
when the Spirit reveals this, and what the way He will do that is by continuing to allow circumstances that bring it up. You'll find yourself doing the same thing again and again, the same issues coming up. Here's what I believe the Lord wants. He wants you to look at that and go, what am I telling myself? What am I seeing in my mind that is motivating me to act on that? And when you see what that is, you're to refute it and call it the lie that it is. I erase it. I erase it and I replace it. I, listen, I erase it, I replace it, and then I embrace that. And somebody can think of another word if you want, but we must confront the false ideas in our soul and refuse to believe. Listen, what you're literally doing, the reason it's in your soul is because at some point you believed it. You remember? That's how it got there. The reason it's remaining there is you're still believing it. You still believe it's valid. You still believe it has use. You still believe it has power in your life. And when you remove it, you do so by withholding and withdrawing your faith that you once put in it from it and redirecting your faith into the principle of truth that corresponds to it. If your way of dealing with your marriage has been, been anger, frustration, manipulation, and you catch yourself doing that and you say, I don't want to, no, 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 I don't want to do that anymore. And you, put, you push that away and push it away and push it away and you go here to the Lord and say, how should I be living in my, in my marriage? And he goes like, like this, with love, with kindness, with grace. And you take that idea and you see it in your mind and you embrace it. You push that away and you pull that in and you embrace that and you do it again and again, day after day after day, moment after moment after moment, and that becomes your new reality. And that's how it works. Now, the last part is a little something I learned in psychology. So take it or leave it. But finally, erasing old man ideas frees us from the compulsive reaction of automatic thinking. I mean, have you ever been... <laughs> in a relationship where all of a sudden you start reacting. I mean, you just, you don't even know why you're reacting the way you are, but you are. That's compulsive behavior. That's what we're talking about. Let's close. Sorry, I've gone over a little bit. I didn't realize it. I uh, hope this has been helpful to you. If you, if you have questions about it, if you have conflicts with it, if you don't think it's true, if you think this is, false, then I, I really would appreciate chatting with you about it, hearing what you have to say. All right, Father, again, you know that's true that I have the humility that you've given me, Father, to hear different ideas. Somebody sees better than I do. My pastor's back there. I know he sees more than I do. He's been at it longer. I, I covet his wisdom and his, his honest feedback, and same with others. Thank you for Rick and his feedback and his honesty. And for those here, Father, that I, I, I covet their honesty as well. And I, I just pray that we could see these things. This has served my life so well. I'm so grateful for these things that you've, you've shown me and taught me that they freed me from so much false thinking and so much compulsive behavior, depression, discouragement, heartache, so many things that have been in my life, Father. And now I can live free of those things. And I just ask that, that you would give this same gift to all these here and ask it in Christ's name. Amen.